The first story we're going to look at as a tale of resistance is in the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the woman said, Excuse me, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate it, and gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. This story is not one of faithful resistance, but of failed resistance. Yet, we start here because this is the reason why we must resist now. Had Adam resisted in the beginning, who knows what it would be like. God had given clear instruction. They could eat of any fruit except that which grew in the midst of a garden, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, sometimes when we think of the serpent who tempts Adam and Eve, we think of some little garter snake who's going to come up and whisper, Hey, do you want this apple? Well, that wouldn't be much of a temptation, but don't think of it like that. This word for serpent is used in other places and is used synonymously at times as something like a dragon. Now, it doesn't say in this passage that he was large and intimidating, but... As all dragons in mythology are, this one was definitely crafty. Now we can think, if only Adam had resisted. But put yourself in Adam's shoes. This lure, this temptation to get everything you want. And you don't have to work for it. All you have to do is just reach over and take. It was a job. Adam had been given a significant calling to be fruitful and multiply, to replenish the earth and subdue it, take dominion, stewardship over not just the garden, take it over the world, the entire earth, all the land around him. That's a big job. Yet the serpent says all you have to do is take this fruit and you immediately be like God. You will know. You will have the maturity. You will be able to discern, to even make your own good and evil. We are often lured in different temptations today. In our society, we are lured to think, if I just go immediately to the fast route, I can make things happen right now, even for good causes. We think, well, go the fast route. If I don't like an institution, blow it up and start another one. Do something that will recreate after we get rid of this first one. But it doesn't always work like that. We think, just like Adam, that all we have to do is take now, while we're talking about Adam, when it was Eve who was actually tempted. Well, yes, she was tempted. But we're told by the Apostle Paul that Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. We read that Adam was standing with her. He 
He observed the whole thing. He knew what was going on. And instead of inserting himself between the serpent and his wife, he let his wife lead. He gave leadership to her. He abdicated his responsibilities. So he was impatient. He was also lacking in courage. Now, it's, again, very easy to talk about what Adam did and how if I would have been there, I would have done it differently, but actually, probably not. We often think that we have a really good plan, and yet it doesn't happen the way we want. When we see something that's hard, we think, it's not worth it. Why try? Again, go back to the old Star Trek Next Generation phrase that the Borg uses, resistance is futile. We think that resistance is futile. Just go with the current. If we're Adam, we, had, we would have no idea how long it would have taken to resist. Some people think, well, either he resisted the temptation, and then five minutes later, it's over, and he's achieved victory for all time. Probably not. Evil was already in the world. It was in the world before Adam and Eve were tempted. We have no idea how long this resistance would take. But we do know how long it took for man to fall. That was just a brief moment. We see in this passage that our physical war, the war of those who are faithful to God, who are being oppressed, who are being put down by those who are seeking power, we equate that as merely a physical war. When actually, yes, there are physical components to it, but the war of resistance that Christians fight is first and foremost spiritual. And the spiritual part of the war has to be fought first. So what are a few lessons we can learn from this passage about resistance, even though it's failed resistance? First of all, we see that resistance demands that you remember God's word, that you remember God's clear commands. There's all kinds of ways that we could resist. And one of the lures that we have is to resist in all the areas that it doesn't matter nearly as much. We must resist first where God's word is clear and where by the world it is contradicted. You cannot fix problems that are in another part of the world. But you can resist where you are knowing what God's Word teaches. So know where you must resist. The second thing we can learn is that resistance requires you to lead your household if you're a man. If you're the husband, in your home, you must learn from our father, Adam. Adam did not lead his household. He followed. Now, that doesn't mean you demand everyone conform to your opinion, that they adopt your perspective on every matter of greatest down to the least bits of importance. No. But in the areas that count, you're called to lead. That begins by teaching. Make clear to your family what God's Word says and that you are going to follow that. As Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Israelites had not been faithful to follow Yahweh when they were in Egypt. Joshua talked about how they had followed the Egyptian gods. But Joshua said, now that we are in this land, my household will serve the Lord. 
and you must do the same thing. Resistance is not something you accomplish if you are married and you have a family. It's not something you accomplish on your own. You must begin by leading them. So, lead your family. Make clear to them what God's Word says. And then be willing to stand wherever Scripture teaches us to stand.